morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So today we're carrying on with the, um, the book of First Peter and I've got the blessing of going through First Peter chapter 3 verses 8 to 18 with you guys. Um, it's, it's a very difficult passage but I mean <laughs> that's not saying much because First Peter is very difficult um, and so I've been racking my brains about this a lot and I'll give you the best of what I think is being said here, and I hope that these words stir in your mind, that you go through these in your own time. Think about what scripture says, think about what I've said, and see how it sits with your soul. The passage we have today is, um, starts, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this we, you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, and do not be frightened. But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. So from my reading of this passage, I have tried to segment it into three different parts, and they kind of blend together and bleed together, so I'll do my best to segment it. But the first point I have, I would call being a blessing. If we look in verse 9, it reads, Do not repay evil with evil, or insult with insult. On the contrary, to pay evil with blessing. And from a plain reading of this text, you might get the interpretation um, that this means to become very ultra pacifistic. And I don't think that's what the passage is saying here at all. I don't think we are being told to allow evil and to give it a foothold, a stronger foothold in our lives and in our environment. What we are told is to be a blessing, which has wildly different context, uh, context has a wildly different context. Um, if you allow me to explain from Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, which is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Um, it says this, Yahweh said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless, bless you, and curse those who curse you. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. You see, Abraham was told, or Abram at the time, was told to follow the Lord's command, and he would be a blessing, and a blessing to all people through that. He wasn't told to be a blessing to those who blessed him, and a curse to those who cursed him. Rather, just by simply walking in the Lord's commandments, those around him would either seek, um, sorry, seek benefit or seek destruction, and it would be God, and not us, who would answer those people in kind. So the very same promise that God gave to Abraham is the promise that has come down to us as we have been grafted in to the children of Abraham through the grace of Jesus Christ and our belief in him. Which means that we then have to follow God's commands the same way that Abraham did. And when we follow his commands, we will be a blessing. And again, we shouldn't misunderstand what it means to be a blessing. It's not simply being loving because that can be misconstrued. Being loving in a modern day context might sound like, you know, just let everyone do as they please, because that's the loving thing to do. But anyone who's a parent knows that's not loving. You have to discipline a child, and God certainly disciplines his children. In that case then, we as Christians have a duty to stand firm in our faith and to continue, walk, continue to walk faithfully in Christ despite what may come against us, because discipline will come to those who don't. And continued rebellion will lead to disregard. 
As Christ said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him. And not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. So we need to remain firmly in the camp of Christ and keep ourselves outside of the camp that is without him. As St. Peter points out in the main passage that we're going through, he quotes King David, 1 Peter 3, verses 9 to 12, saying, Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears, ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So St. Peter and King David are in agreement that in order to be a blessing, ultimately to, uh, and ultimately to enter into the blessing of the kingdom of heaven, we must keep ourselves from evil. And David goes further to say these things quite strongly. So firstly, he talks about those who follow God. He says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who <coughs> fear him. And he delivers them. When I said, my foot is slipping, your unfailing love supported me. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. And of those who disregard God, he said, they pour out arrogant words. All the evildoers are full of boasting. They crush our people, O Lord. They oppress your inheritance. They slay the widow and the foreigner. They murder the fatherless, and they say the Lord does not see. The wicked band together against the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But God will repay them for their sins and destroy them for their wickedness. So firstly, of those, the phrase to fear God does not mean that we should be terrified of him. It's in the, in the sense of the Hebrew word yai, which it carries an element of reverence, so as in to worship. When we worship God, we are in awe of his greatness, and we recognize our need for a savior. And so when Jonah, in the book of Jonah, cries out, uh, he's, he's talking to the sailors, sorry, and he says, it is Yahweh, the God of heaven, who I, Yahweh, which is I worship and I fear. You can translate it both ways. And secondly, what we see here is the camps are clearly against one another. You have one camp who is for the foreigners, uh, for the widows, for the fatherless, and the other camp who wants to destroy the widows of fathers, uh, widows, fatherless, foreigners. Um, so clearly, these two camps cannot walk in step with, with one another. And this brings me to my second point, walking in step with Christ. In verse 8, um, Peter says this means to be like-minded, sympathetic, having brotherly love, and being compassionate and humble. And this is echoed almost word for word by St. Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 to 3, which states, Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one of spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, there are a few things here. Firstly, uh, St. Peter and St. Paul both talk about being like-minded. And there's a bit of a debate going on between whether this means that all should agree with one another, or whether or not this means to have a singular focused goal which you strive towards. And I can't say I've, I've come to a definitive answer of which one I think it is. However, there is a point where St. Paul says, and be of, uh, be of like mind, short, uh, sorry, and be of one mind, shortly after saying, be of like mind. So I don't think it's a case of either or. It's a classic case of the Christian both and, where they kind of merge together. And I love the symmetry of this because St. Paul to the Apostle to the Gentiles and Peter the Apostle to the Jews, to both groups of people were given the same message that as followers of Christ, we should be singularly focused on one thing, which is the obedience to God, but also that we should be in agreement with one another, which dictates that we should both be a united and ever steadfast force. Now how we walk in step with Christ in this regard is quite clear, because Christ himself was of one mind with God the Father, and the Holy Spirit was of one mind with Christ. Christ's steadfast and single-minded goal was that the gospel would be preached throughout all the world, that we all may receive the glory of God and be saved. 
And he did this, of course, by giving himself over to death, even to death on a cross, as Philip Hughes put it. And next, we are told to be sympathetic, compassionate, and humble. These, of course, teach us how we are to walk in step with our fellow man. We have to put our, aside our own wants and desires. And here's the trick. We don't put on the wants and desires of the other person. But we put on the wants and desires of God, which is to serve the other person, putting them above ourselves. Does that make sense? I know it's quite tricky there. Um, and paraphrasing a little bit from Matthew 25, Jesus says that those who clothed, fed, and gave drink to those who needed it, in effect, clothed, fed, and gave drink to God. So it is clear by serving people that we serve God. So these points together, they are the golden rule put down by Christ. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbour as yourself, as all the laws fall under these two commandments. And Peter actually tells us in verse 15 that we should revere Christ as Lord. That's that word again, that revere, that fear, and uh, worship. It pops up here. Because in revering him, we find Christ to be holy, sacrosanct, awesome. Holy in that Christ should be set apart as Lord in our hearts, meaning there should be no Lord beside him. Sacrosanct in that he should be known to be unchanging, which means we cannot reinvent Christ for our own purposes. And of course, with awesome, that is that yare, that worship, that fear that we have for the reverence, the greatness of Jesus Christ that is far beyond ourselves where we recognise we need him to be our saviour. And when we recognise this, this leads us inevitably, of course, to emulation of Christ. And with the emulation of Christ comes the inevitable enmity of the world towards Christ, which will then be referred on to us. So this brings me to my third and final point, that we should suffer as Christ has suffered. Verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God, he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Christ knew what to be his fate, and he accepted it. He continued in the will of the Father and was taken to the cross. There he was raised up to answer for our crimes, and he was put to death. <coughs> but his death tore the veil between God and man, and now freely all have access to come to him, come to the Father. And on the day where Christ rose again, we knew that death had been defeated. And now the, the gates of heaven stand open, ready to receive all those who are willing to do the will of the Father, to believe in Christ and follow him. And since the day of Pentecost, we have had the great gift of the Holy Spirit has come down to each and every one of us, living with us, existing in us, that he may remind us of all the great things that Christ has done and help us to continue to walk faithfully in step with him. Now, of course, this is no easy task to um, pick up Jesus' cross daily and follow him as he tells us to. And Paul tells us that there are many that live as enemies of the cross of Christ. So the cross alone, bearing that symbol, is something that can cause persecution for us today. And maybe less so in this country than in other countries, but Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world, and we have to be aware of this. And I think that we need to be fervently aware of our own salvation, for our hope of what is to come that might that will carry us on forward. That's the only way I can see people being as steadfast as they are in countries where there is so much persecution, so much more than what we have here. And in 1 Peter, I'm picking here, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13, 14, 15, and 17 say this. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats and do not be frightened. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than doing evil. And to take a slightly strange example, but I hope you permit me to do so. About two years ago, a video game came out where you get to play as a Viking. But in this game, 
you attack monasteries and churches, you steal their gold and you kill monks. Uh, I remember a journalist wrote about this game and saying, this is exactly what the mentality that we need in the modern day. We need a mentality of, yes, let's kill Christ and his church. Now, I don't hold much stock in this uh, journalist's reach, but it clearly shows us the mentality of the world that we're living in today. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we kowtow to this kind of mentality? Do we bend beneath it? Do we try and hide from the world that is out there trying to harm us and strip away everything that makes us unique and who we are? in order that we don't get noticed? Or do we stand firm for what we believe in, what Christ has taught us to believe in, and say that this is who we are. We are steadfast, strong, and willing to suffer for him. And it, of course it's difficult. It, no one wants to suffer. No one is asking for suffering. And if you are, you might question why. But for me, I look at these great men of history that have rightfully earned the name of saint. And I just think, I wish, I hope to have the faith, the fervor that they have. To name a few of these, I just, I am in awe of them. Saint Paul for one. Obviously, once he saw the vision of Christ, he became a radically different man. He changed everything about himself to the point where he was willing to go through so much to suffer for the gospel. To the point where he went into a city at one point, prayed, uh, Jesus Christ preached the gospel to the point where he was stoned almost to death. The people thought he was dead, took his body out of the city, and a short while later, he got up, went back into the city and carried on preaching. Wow. St. Patrick, what a guy. What a, he was a Welshman, right? Captured by the Irish. He was made a slave, and he was in Ireland as a slave for six whole years. And once he finally escaped, he made it back to Britain. God gave him a vision of Christ in a dream. And he was told to go back to Ireland and become a slave again. And so he did. He became a slave again uh, under a Northern Irish chieftain. I can't quite remember his name. But then in Ireland for the next 40 years until his death, he preached the gospel to the point where all of Ireland had changed from being pagan to Christian because of St. Patrick and his works. St. Columbanus was an Irish monk who existed maybe a hundred years later. And he was a child of St. Patrick's doctrine, St. Patrick's teachings. He left Ireland, traveled to the kingdom of Burgundy, and one of the first things he did was he, he admonished King Tudric II for living with a mistress. So everyone that the king liked hated um, St. Columbanus. They all went after him, they captured him, they tortured him, he escaped. What did he do with his newfound freedom? He traveled further up the river Rhine to the tribes of the Swavi, and he preached the gospel there. To the point where so many people there became Christian that King Tudric found out, chased him down, captured him, tortured him. He escaped again. What did he do the third time? This time he sailed to Milan, I think it was. Yes, he sailed to Milan. And he challenged the king who was there about Arianism. His entire life was devoted to this is the Christ I know. This is the Christ I want to teach you. I do not care what comes my way. All of these men really have lived out that famous passage that we can all recite. But I'm not going to get you to recite it. But we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character produces hope. If you suffer adversity, you either learn fortitude and as you persevere through it, or you crumble in its presence. We need to learn to be people of perseverance. And to be honest, some of you are better at that than I am. But that's why we're in a church. Because we can learn from one another. We love one another. We grow from one another. So we need to be those kind of people that build one another up in love, humility, and righteousness. To stand with, not, with one another and not speak maliciously against one another. We need to be that strong, united force with one goal. Mm. Because if we do this, we will build up our perseverance. We will build up our own character through our perseverance. And a great name will be carved out because of us. And that name, beyond any other name, will be the name of Jesus Christ. And when Christ's name is built up through us, we will be blessed. And we will be a blessing to those in our town, to our neighbours, to our families. 
Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the fact that you gave us the Holy Spirit, that we may know Christ even now after his death and resurrection. You remind us daily of everything that Christ has done for us. I pray that we will persevere like the great saints of old. I pray that you'll give us the strength to carry on when we find ourselves in times of turmoil and suffering. Lord, give us strength and give us peace. I pray that you will be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.